So we find ourselves underneath the temple of Poseidon at Sunion. This cliff had many, many mythological uh, significations back in ancient Greece. It's perhaps best known for the place out of which Aegeas, Aegeas, the father of Theseus, the man who killed the Minotaur. So his father Aegeas jumped when he saw his son's ship approaching with a black sail that was there put by accident. And uh, he believed his son was dead. So out of sorrow, he threw himself and all the sea from here to Turkey was called by his name Aegeon, the Aegean Sea, the Sea of Aegeus. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be joined by a fellow traveler in this journey, Tom Roussel. Tom, welcome to Greece. <laughs> great to be here, Michael. It's a wonderful country. Thank you very much. The weather, the architect, the ancient ruins, the yes. archaeology, history. The, the food we're going to eat afterwards, oh, yes. very important. Looking forward to that. Um, I was myself very happy to, to meet you online first. Well, discovering you online, then meet you a couple of times. I interviewed you, you interviewed me. Now we're interviewing each other um, it, and it's all good. <laughs> I was joking to my, to my wife saying that uh, there's at least 500 people in this world that are going to be very, very excited of seeing <laughs> us together, like truly excited. And uh, she was like, hmm, great, hmm, that's not a lot though. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's a lot. It's 500, 500. I if guess. it was a rumor, it would feel like a lot of people. Yeah, true, very true. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe you're part of this 500 <laughs> that are very happy to see us together, but here we are. Um, I'm Michael Megalidis from Ancient Greece Revisited. I'm Tom Roussel from Survive the Jive. And we're both in this journey of understanding our past, understanding our ancient past, our mythological past, our spiritual past. Uh, tackling it from two different cultures, Greek and Br Br Britonic, I guess. British, Eng English rather, yeah. English, English. yeah. And uh, yeah, trying to, in a sort of sense, trying to rediscover the gods. Uh, although I think, Tom, you are much more uh, in the practicing side of paganism, correct? That's right, yeah. I'm a practicing pagan and I came to that uh, via philosophy rather than religion. I was an atheist for a long time and one of, being an atheist led me to Nietzsche, but Nietzsche actually led me towards uh, a real appreciation for Dionysus, ancient Greek paganism. And from there I studied other forms of paganism, including that of my own ancestors, the, the British, the English, and, uh, and I'm a practicing English pagan. Right, it, but the, that is the, the first time I heard that I was like, what does that mean? Because I can imagine very much, you know, the, the, the Greek pantheon obviously is very well known, very well documented. The Nordic pantheon, which I absolutely loved as a child and teenager. Uh, but how, how is the, the English pagan pa pantheon looking? English paganism is basically just a, a regional variant of Germanic paganism that was the same as Norse paganism. It's just the names are pronounced differently. Uh, they were, I mean, at the time that the Anglo-Saxons came to England. The um, Scandinavian language was even more like English than, than it was later in the Viking Age. And even in the Viking Age, they were mutually intelligible. So when the Vikings came, the English and the Vikings could speak, converse with each other. It was practically the same language. Uh, and it certainly earlier on, when the, during the migration era, it was even more similar. So like, I think in the migration era, Woden was the main Anglo-Saxon god, whereas in Scandinavia, he was called Wodin. Woden, Wodin, and then Wodin becomes Odin. It's, mm. it's the same God. It's mm. not really, we don't have a, as many sources on English paganism as we do on Norse paganism. So a lot of understanding English paganism is looking at the Norse sources and then comparing them to the English Trying and bringing it, bring it back to reconstruct it. That's fascinating. I didn't know that the, the English and the Vikings, let's say, were mutually intelligible. Mm. I thought the, the Vikings looked very, very foreign when they came to conquer. They, they were, the, moon, the, thing, the thing about them that was foreign was their religion, because by that stage, the Anglo-Saxons had been Christian for a couple hundred years. And so pagans coming and wrecking the monasteries was very threatening and foreign. It would be, you know, the equivalent of like uh, some outposts of Greek pagans 
suddenly started raiding uh, Mount uh, the Byzantine the, Empire. Yeah, Byzantine Empire well, the fact that they themselves used to practice that religion doesn't really make any difference. Yeah, yeah, there wasn't. Um, it, you know, like you said, that the the Viking uh, mythology is, is most well documented. But I think that in contrast with Greek sources that are, are being preserved in the original by the people who believed in them, you know, like the Homeric hymns, for example, which are some of the earliest uh, fragments of Greek religion and are some very, very beautiful uh, po poems written around the time that the, the, and before perhaps the Iliad was being composed, right? Uh, they're called Homeric, but they're not written by Homer. They're of that era and of that style. And so you can hear the voice of someone who truly sung that as a prayer. Well, I think, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of the even Norse material was written by the people that, who were already converted. So That's it's correct. written almost like a memory of an age gone part by. It's correct that there are no contemporary uh, literary sources for Viking Age religion. Or, uh, so the, the, the sources we have that are contemporary, we do have contemporary sources that are outside, non-Norse, like Gem, Gem, a German monk describing them or whatever, or, or, an, or a Muslim uh, emissary uh, from Baghdad, Ibn Fadlan. But the actual, there are no native contemporary sources from the actual practitioners, like you have from Greece. But uh, you're talking like a couple of hundred years or so after, uh, you have most of it written down by a chieftain, an Icelandic chieftain, Snorri Sturluson. And he wasn't writing it down as a memory or a historical document. He was writing it down because the Icelandic skaldic culture, like skalds were like the, the bards, uh, what survived. And uh, it, it was so, the way that the poetry uh, and the songs they used to, uh, as part of their court culture, you know, their uh, drinking culture and their culture in general of pra praise poems, much like they found in ancient Greece, very much the same thing. Uh, that was, it is essential to understand the mythology because all the poetic similes and metaphors used uh, as a compulsory part of that poetic form refer to myth mythological uh, events. So in order for people to continue that tradition, it was necessary for a knowledge of the mythology to continue. And that's why he wrote it down because he was trying to help people to continue that poetic thing. Oh. He was a Christian. He didn't want paganism to survive as a religion, but he just needed knowledge of that pagan religion to survive for that mythological, uh, for that poetic purpose. Yeah, this is super interesting. And that poetic tradition, you know, is very strong in all the Indo-European cultures. There's a book out there called How to Kill a Dragon. Uh, you might be aware, I bought it. It's a big tome of a book try to read it it was i didn't get very far um i kind of skim read it it's a book on indo-european po po poetics right and uh, it makes you realize that um, what an art form it was first of how important the bard was in these indo-european cultures far more than just a, a gimmick at a party right he carried an entire civilization like now we have hard disks where we store for our pictures and we, we retrieve them months or years later and we remember back then, you know, you can imagine this very early Indo-European uh, culture that was traveling uh, around and uh, with no writing and they literally carried their entire civilization in their memory, in their heads and they had to, and these special people, the bards could regurgitate just repeat that tradition and make them make it alive, right? Right. It's hard to stress how important they must have been because they weren't only conveyors of cultural traditions, the histories, the religion, the mythology, which all were communicated in this. It probably the poems were actually songs. It's important to note they were probably sung. Mm -hmm. The Rig Veda and the uh, Homeric writings are the, probably the oldest examples that we have because both in Greece and India, the tradition of literacy was introduced. Uh, via different Middle Eastern routes. And as a result, we have this access to it. But even the Rig Veda is only 1500 BC. We're talking this tradition goes back uh, thousands of years earlier than that. It's about 5,000 years old minimum. Mm -hmm. And the word reconstructed of significance for what, what the power these bards had is kleros, which uh, uh, has a mm -hmm. Greek word that sounds very similar. Yeah. Um, and it, the, the, the bard 
had the ability to bestow this on mm, the hero. Mm, mm. So if you were a great leader or a warrior or a, a, anything, you needed the poetry or songs to be sung that would prove it because their religious belief system uh, was such that they, and it's well, well expressed in the, in the Germanic paganism in the Norse uh, proverb like cattle die, kinsmen die, mm. you yourself may die, but one thing I know never dies, the fame of an honored man. Mm. Basically, the, the, that meant the bard had the power to bestow immortality yes. on yes. people through his art. On a culture like the Indo-European that was, unlike other cultures, uh, a little dubious on the underla of the afterlife. I mean, all Indo-European cultures had, a, had an idea about you know, this life force that we are continuing after our physical death, for sure. But they didn't bother as much as other cultures. Like if you look at ancient Egypt, their monuments were essentially tombs. Mm. You know, you, you need to imagine what the mental state of a culture who adorned their skyline with tombs, great tombs, so that everyone can see, uh, like a tribute to death. You know, a culture that saw death as very near and very uh, personal, like a brother almost, and then you go to, you know, the Indo-European cultures, even in very typically ancient Greece, that has a very poor idea of death. It's like they don't bother showing, you know, the underworld in ancient Greek mythology is very poorly described. And that comes from a culture that's very, very good at describing things that it's interested in. I think there's, a, the, the words used in Indo-European for the underworld goddess are usually cognate with something meaning covered or hidden. Yep. So there's an idea of the underworld in Indo-European religions that it's something hard to understand, hard mm. to see. It's a murky, dark, cold yeah. place, yeah. and they don't fully understand what goes down there, and they don't claim to. And in the Germanic religion, actually, that mystical, unknowable knowledge is actually part of the tradition because Odin is one who pursues that knowledge. Mm. He goes, but the, the going into the underworld to pursue things is found in many Indo-European yes. myths, including yes. Greek. But I don't agree that they don't, uh, about that, I mean, they definitely didn't know, claim, like they definitely had a kind of mystical, unknowable aspect of the mm. afterlife. But mm -hmm. death was so important in their belief. I believe mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. death was present uh, to the extent that the, in my opinion, the greatest symbol of Indo-European culture is the barrow, which uh, is simple earthen mound which is comparatively like humble compared to g impressive tombs of Egypt or like even well, what ancient Greeks developed. Like the, the Taj Mahal, yeah. The Taj Mahal, <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's, it's just a, a, a mound of earth. Yeah. And, uh, this tradition began 5,000 years ago or with the original proto-Europeans actually, but it was still, you mean, the Vikings continued 1,000 years ago. They were still doing the same thing. And uh, for them, they called the barrow Dauthradur, the doors of the dead. And for them, it was a portal mm -hmm. uh, to communicate mm -hmm. with the ancestors. Mm -hmm. So for them, the ancestors were present, the dead, mm -hmm. the honored, not maybe all of them, but the honored heroic great mm -hmm. dead, because mm -hmm. most people didn't get to be in a barrow, mm -hmm. but the great men, the kinds who were sung about by the bards, mm -hmm. they were in the barrows and they were accessible uh, at those barrows and they were worshiped even mm -hmm. almost like gods. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is something that's quite, in, I mean, very Indo-European, if I may use my own cat's <laughs> phrase. The, uh, they, they honored heroes, they sung epic poems about them or songs about them, and they even conducted rituals uh, to honor them. Uh, although none of those things are specifically unique to Indo-Europeans, mm -hmm. they are very strong parts of Indo-European cultures. Yeah. Yeah, true. And uh, like you spoke about Odin and it came to mind the fact that, you know, whenever I try to speak about the Germanic gods, where I know far less than the Greek gods, I always try to map them to the Greek gods. And there's a naive tendency that I was also part of, unfortunately, where just, ma just saying, you know, Odin was the father of the gods, uh, Zeus was the father of the gods, so Odin is Zeus and it's a natural thing to do, but it's not, it, and I, I do it too, but it's not one to one. Yeah. There's not, yes, Odin is equivalent to Zeus as the chief of the gods, the king of the gods, the father of the gods. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are other, many other sort of parallels, but also in other, in other ways, Zeus resembles Odin's son Thor because they're yeah, storm gods. Yeah, the thunder gods. god. Yeah, and storm it, god. Athena, a goddess of war uh, and uh, a patron of 
of warriors, that's an exactly equivalent to Freya. But Freya is also equivalent to Aphrodite. Yeah, so yeah. Freya is kind of a mixture of Aphrodite and Athena. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And like I said, I, I, I'm in the process of correcting myself because it's very much like, you know, from all that exists, it seems to me like different people took different like cookie cutters and they cut different shapes out and named them and identified and saw the gods in that. And for a god in the Germanic pantheon that might be very well a part of Hermes, a part of Zeus, uh, because they just cut, s split the world differently, uh, which is what cr creates all this richness of difference, you know? Mm. And I think, like segueing into another topic, there is this um, idea that you find among people among people perhaps who watch our shows, who are interested in these discussions, you find a sort of perennialism, as it's called, you know, this idea that uh, everything is one, all is one, God is one, God is everything there is, you are God, I am God, and that's it. And I find it, although I feel there is some profound truth at the end of this image, I also feel that people are rushing prematurely there before noticing all the important differences and nuances of each god, you know, do, do, do you have similar experience? I think that was very eloquently put and I agree. The, um, I, th I think that the idea of like the oneness of everything has existed in multiple cultures, including in the European ones like in India and in Greece, mm -hmm. uh, Platonism in Greece has had it, but it's always been an esoteric special knowledge for an elite that isn't yes. supposed to be widely understood. Yes. Now it's being popularized. And yes. That's dangerous because it doesn't help people to understand that. I think there was a Hindu expression, I'm paraphrasing, um, you must first know God without before you can understand God within. Yeah. So if you go around saying, yeah, well, God is me, I'm, and you, we're yeah. all God, that doesn't help you understand anything at all. In fact, it will mislead you and, and probably corrupt you. Uh, but yes, uh, there, is, there is a truth to it, but it's a truth that is not accessible to the uninitiated. Yes, exactly. And, and the difference between, you know, a normal person and a mythic is, is not necessarily one of language. They may sp both speak English, they may both speak French, but the mystic will say something that means something very different to him. And, you know, for better or worse, the, the most profound mystical experiences that I've had were through the use of psychedelics. And I'm, I'm very open to someone coming and say that's a fake experience that, you know, it's all up for debate for me still. I'm not dogmatic in anything, but, uh, you know, I did live through some things that at least gave me a glimpse of how different spiritual dimensions could be. I'm like, maybe this is the crack cocaine of religiosity. Fair enough. But I'm convinced experientially, I can't prove it, that this is at least a part of the puzzle. So, mm when you are in these states you may say something that sounds so profound to you because you understand something much more profound in these words but it then you write it down and you read it out to yourself the next day and you're like what was that all yeah. about they don't get even you know these cheap well you know like these very pop hippie kind of dresses you know with the psychedelic uh, mandalas and stuff where i used to see in greek islands you know, usually tourists, I was like, you know, get a better t-shirt. And, <laughs> and then after some experiences, I was like, I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. I know, obviously it's a very, very cheap, pale comparison to the vision that you might see, but you recognize the reference. And I'm like, you could go to a church, I could go to a church and not have the same connection to an image of Jesus, unfortunately perhaps, but someone who has had a similar experience within the context of Christianity might see it, might see the picture of Jesus and say, yes, that, that's the meaning, you know? Yes, I certainly think that uh, hallucinogenic drugs or other kind of uh, substances, entheogenic substances, can uh, facilitate that same uh, spiritual experience that people have in many cultures uh, achieved without necessarily using uh, them. I mean, for example, in the ancient Greek culture, uh, I think it's widely agreed, Eleusis, the cult of Eleusis yes. involved the use of an entheogen. Uh, but that doesn't mean that no one, uh, the other 
pagans of Greece who weren't involved in the cult of Eleusis didn't also achieve uh, intense ex uh, spiritual experiences without entheogens. And some cultures have used other techniques like chanting, uh, breath control, saunas and, ste and like, mm -hmm. you know, heat, uh, sweat lodges and um, uh, uh, many other things. Um, I, I, I'm not against uh, the use of entheogens in spiritual contexts at all. I think they can be very, have very positive results, but uh, I agree with Julius Evola, who wrote on the subject where that this also poses as much of a threat as it does an opportunity to a sort of despiritualized Western man, because while it can like, open up new vistas and uh, intellectual horizons for someone who's previously blinkered uh, by the cultural the restrictions of our cultures, uh, it can also cause you it can also lead you down a bad path. And sometimes the focus can be too much on the substance and not on the, uh, on the, what the potential of the substance can, yes. can give you. It, Carl Jung said something similar. Uh, I, I almost remember his phrase verbatim. He said, there's no better way to convince someone of the scientific materialist mindset than the use of psychedelics, because there you give him this supposedly anti-material experience through a chemical substance. Mm -hmm. So you're essentially, and I see this danger very clearly, where people can say, look, that's, you know, all these visions that you hear, the, you know, the vision of uh, Saint Mary, um, um, Saint Teresa, um, they, she was just tripping. Yeah. She, it, it was just uh, uh, brain chemicals in, yeah brain chemistry going wrong or right, depending. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so there's definitely these, because the truth be told, I am, as I've been in most of my life, in the process of trying to at least imagine beyond the realm of scientific materialism. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that I recognize is how difficult it is um, and how easy it is to go back in with things like psychedelic, where you, you you have an experience and you go that's it and then you immediately think but that's it through a chemical once again mm, you know mm. and it's not just the substance because and i've actually never told that in public but i have had one more um uh transcendent you might say experience that was induced upon me uh through music by 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 an indian by hindu that I met in London in a very mundane place. He owned a little cafe. It's a long and, to me at least, fascinating story that it's a little long to just recount in, in total. But essentially, I just walked in his cafe when I was, in the early years I was living in London, I had no idea what I was doing in my life. I was kind of, you know, working like odd jobs, like just scratching my head to see where the whole thing is going to go. So I, at, at times I had this dark cloud in my head and I just went in and uh, I meet this guy who had this, this little in Covent Garden on the outside. And uh, he always, he, again, talking about the mystical, the mystic speaking the same language that you do, but his words just mean something very different. He had that because he would say something that would be so cheesy in the mouth of anyone else. But as soon as he said, I was like, very interesting. And, just this little clip of my life, you know, the, the first time he saw me, he, he said, um, you know, where are you from? I said, I'm from, well, I'm from Greece. And he goes, ah, Greece, he said. It's that country with this beautiful instrument, the bazooka. <laughs> and I said, oh, bazooki, you mean bazooki, yes. Yes, thank you, yes, it, it has a beautiful sound. And then he did like, he had this thing where he did a double take and he left and just turned back and <laughs> He did that a few times, and every time he turned back, he would like revert the meaning of what he was saying. He says, you know why I said that? I said, no. He said, because the music produced by this instrument is like a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> it, like, it, 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 it would have been so cheesy, but, but I was like, I, you know, you felt it. And, you know, that's the first time I met him, and long, you know, a year later, I. You know, he claimed to be a musician. He claimed to be a Hindu musician uh, who's, you know, like uh, uh, in, in, into a spiritual practice. And then the, 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 
a year later, I see him tuning his sitar. And I was like, wow, Guru Saad it was his name. Nothing to do with Guru Saad today. But I said, um, you know, why, did, why didn't you play for us? And he did play a little bit after he took a little bit of convincing. He, he actually closed his shop. We were alone, uh, me and my then, you know, girlfriend. And he played. He played to both of us. And uh, nothing happened then. But I walked back home and I remember sitting on the sofa and there was some kind of split happening, almost like a part of me sat and another stood up. And there was a, 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 a purely, now I can recognize it, psychedelic experience. Yes. Right then and there. Yes. And a few moments later, the phone rings. It's my girlfriend. And she's like, oh my God, your guru has enchanted me. I feel this, that, the other. And I'm like, that's how I feel as well. And, I'm, and so, so, so it was confirmed, at least by two people, that we both had this experience mm -hmm. simultaneously but apart you know mm -hmm. almost like he he put a time bomb to us and we kind of exploded in our own houses um, and I cherish this experience because it was very real and it had nothing to do with the psychedelics so I know that these things can happen mm. differently uh, in a different context yes you know but it's the, 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 the problem that we have as modern men is that the uh, in traditional cultures yeah. you will be initiated into a technique that gives you the this access to this this experience, and whatever, whatever it is depends on the culture. Uh, it can be music, it can be dancing, it can be chants, or, or, or all sorts of things can be used. But um, trying to find it yourself is very hard, and it, sometimes you stumble on it by accident. But developing a, a practice where you can actually arrive at it when you want to mm. is a bit trickier. And of course, even in, I don't think even in ancient times, for example, that this was something that was widely accessible. Because the, the cult of Eleusis was not open. It was a mystery cult. It was a mystery, You couldn't yes. just find it out, like read it on the, in the newspaper or anything, or Google it. Yes. So in that sense, it's not that different. We're not that different a scenario. You know, it's no, it's no more accessible now than it was then, even though we have all this information at our fingertips. But uh, we don't have um, the option to join one of these mystery cults. But there are... Um, of course, foreign religions, but uh, as Westerners, it's always a problem, in my opinion, to try and uh, join uh, a, a foreign, a very foreign Oriental religion, for example, because our, our own assumptions uh, and misunderstandings about their cultures co corrupt our perspective and prevent us from actually arriving at the uh, at the right. Way of yes. seeing it, the Orientalist side of viewpoint. I, I mean, I, I I love Hinduism, and I and I also l learn a lot from Hinduism, and in, I love Indian music and things. But I love it as a non-Indian, mm -hmm. which is not the same way that an Indian can love it. Mm -hmm. So that that's the, the problem. I, I absolutely agree, and I've noticed that. And uh, to 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 connect it back to what we said about hippies, about mis ab 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 about letting out the secret. You said something that this oneness was always a secret. And I immediately remember of Alan Watts, if you know, yes. without... If, he great, tried to popularize it in California. Great in California. popularized and succeeded in popularizing um, a version of Buddhism slash Hinduism slash Zen. It was never clear. And uh, he did exactly that. And uh, it took me a lot of years to realize that the version of Hinduism that I believe was authentic was very Alan Wattsist. Without actually reading him, I read other derivatives, even some like Osho, like Bhagwan Rajneesh, who was a Hindu himself, uh, a Jain, I think, but uh, Indian born, raised. Uh, he also believe had this mm -hmm. westernized version mm. of Hinduism, right? Well, it's not just Hinduism. I did a little research on this recently because this idea that Watts had, the, the universe, God is the universe experience itself. We are the universe experience itself. Like, mm -hmm. and that's God or mm. something like that. That is expressed in the Shaivite uh, version of Hinduism. Uh, like there, there's an expression similar to that, uh, which might be where Watts was taking it from, but it's also in Kabbalah. So esoteric Judaism has a version of it. Uh, I think that there are other versions as well, but I think I don't consider it to be incorrect Mm. But I do consider it to be wrong in another sense. I, it, it, there is well a said. truth to it. Yeah, very it's, well said. It's very corrupting. It's not incorrect, but it's wrong. <laughs> I, I like that. It, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> I like it. 
um, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, you see how, you know, you can look into this, you know, because it's not apparent at first sight. Like, you know, back in the day, I used to think I'm going to read the Rig Veda and it's going to be right there in the front. You are God. Blah, blah. It, it's not. It's you read and it's very ritualistic, very much about spells, essentially, ways to honor the people who had just died and invoking, you know, Agni, the goddess of fire. Very ritualistic, um, almost boring, dare I say, at times for a non-initiate, right? That very repetitive to a certain degree to be more respectful to it. But um, uh, so it's not obvious. You need to really, really look for it. And while you re look for it, you stumble upon a lot of other things that have to be, ch to be chucked out for you, the Westerner, to be able to essentially do whatever the hell you want guilt-free. Because mm. that's a lot of what these people are doing. And they mm. have to throw out a lot of the normative part that actually tells you how to marry, whom to marry, how many children you have, how to teach them your skills, to inherit your property. All that goes out the window for the Alan Wattist type. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and they go straight to the I am God, no questions That's, asked. And it's, a, it's extremely dangerous. And this is the sort of thing Avila was warning about in the, in the 60s, when, uh, that, that he was quite respectful of the potential of the hippie movement, the hippies and the beatniks and things like that, and their, and their motivations to break with, what had become, with the problems of Western culture. Mm -hmm. Very sincere and valid. Mm -hmm. But they're, and, and they're also, the looking to the east is also very valid. Mm. It's a very wise decision for when our, the West had become somewhat stale spiritually mm. to look to the east. But it is not a good idea to try and be, be the east because mm. we have mm. a, a, an independent spirit from the east that is completely different. And, uh, and if we, w when we try to be eastern, we, we don't succeed, we just corrupt and make yeah. an inferior form of Easternness. Uh, and that, that's what I think could happen in, in California with yeah. un, under some of Watts' uh, uh, followers. Very well said. And kind of, you know, drawing this beautiful conversation near its conclusion, just to focus on that, because it is a mystery to me, this whole decline of the West and of Western spirituality. You know, you said, you know, the hippies came in the 60s as the West had lost touch with its own spirituality. Why? I'm trying to understand. I look at the history of the West and all I see is success upon success upon success. You know, the Industrial Re Revolution, first time the average, uh, you know, life expectancy has been elevated so much. The empires, Britain or France, they conquer the world, you know. Um, then you have the world wars. And then you have the Second World War where essentially there's no goodies and baddies in history. And someone corrected me in the comments when I was criticizing the Third Reich too much because they said that perhaps, unfortunately, some, you know, some of my viewers might have other opinions respectfully. But um, there's no goodies and baddies. But the Second World War, if there was one war where you could kind of say there was a good, good and bad, it was that. And the good side won, I guess. So what is there to worry about? Why, why was there a decline starting right after these great victories? I don't understand. Well, I could, if I could Bane post on, the, on AGR, then I'd say victory has defeated us. But the... The, the, uh, the real thing is, I think, is actually it goes along before the Second World War and it's nothing to do with the Second World War. Uh, I mean, there are a lot, there's a lot of important things to understand about the Second World War to understand the modern West, but the, philosophically speaking, it's nothing to do with the war. And um, it goes back to the Enlightenment and, and things like that. We have, as a consequence, lost our spiritual center. We have embarked on a so-called, people, it's an overused term, but a Faustian, perhaps Promethean, you could even say, pursuit of knowledge. And um, we've done this at the expense of the spiritual core of the West, which has been Christianity in, in recent centuries. And that once that was undermined, we immediately started diffusing the uh, religious impulse to, to, you had the rise of deism and all kinds of and theosophy and all kinds of uh, supplement, you know, surrogates for what we'd lost, which were inauthentic, really, and they didn't last uh, as a result. Although theosophy has long 
ongoing influences on all sorts of uh, intellectual currents within the West. But the, the Nietzsche understood this properly, mm. that the, we were too hasty to kill God. Mm. We should have been a little bit more, we should have thought about what we're doing before we killed our God, mm -hmm. because we weren't ready for it. The average person today who professes atheism and the non-existence of God isn't ready to propose a, a coherent moral foundation that works without that spiritual center to justify it. So we still haven't overcome the problem that Nietzsche identified. And uh, there's a God-shaped hole. The God-shaped hole is still there. Yeah. Uh, for me, I came to the conclusion that religion is essential and that, uh, and then also that paganism is a, a more robust form of religion than Christianity because it doesn't, it isn't a historical, relig a religious historical narrative of history. So you don't have to believe in a certain historical narrative to be a pagan. There, it's not in any way tethered to Experiential events. Experiential and yeah. practical. Yeah. Uh, for me, I guess I'm still looking as intensely as ever, uh, but I truly, truly enjoy and appreciate these discussions, man. So Tom, I hope, truly hope you'll enjoy the rest of your holidays. I hope for the little I could that I made this part better and uh, that we'll keep on looking together. It's been a really enjoyable conversation, Michael, and thank you very much for talking to me. Likewise, man. Likewise. <laughs>